Ah, uh, uh, don't touch that dial. Listen to... Randy! Breakfast is over with at the Bumstead house, and the children, Cookie and Alexander, are upstairs. Dagwood and Blondie are lingering over their coffee, as Dagwood suffers a few pangs of fatherhood. Uh, uh, Blondie, dear. Yes, dear. Uh, Blondie, do you think Alexander still uh, likes me? What? Oh, of course he still likes you, Dagwood. Mm. Now, whatever put that idea yeah, oh, in your head? Oh, nothing. It's just that we used to be pretty close to each other, real pals. Why, we played ball together and boxed and faced and... Oh, I think it's just that Alexander's found some little friends of his own age, that's all. Yeah. You know, boys like Jimmy Decker. Yeah. He never wants to spend any time with me anymore, Blondie. Seems that he'd rather play with Jimmy's pet skunk. (laughs) Hey, what's the skunk got that I haven't got? (laughs) Well, there must be something, dear. You know how boys his age are. Yeah. Well, maybe I haven't given him enough fatherly affection. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to read to Alexander all the time or make up stories for him. Well, I never make up stories for him anymore. No. You're too busy making up stories for me. Yes, I'm too busy to make up for us. Oh, Blondie. Oh, I'm just teasing you, darling. Yeah, gosh. Hmm. Remember how little Alexander used to sit here on my knee when he was a little baby? Yes, dear. <laughs> but he's changed quite a bit now. Yeah. Well, he was changed quite a bit then, too, dear. <laughs> well, Alexander's pretty big to sit on your knee. Oh, I hear them coming downstairs. Yeah. We're going out, Mother. All right, Cookie. We'll see you later, folks. Oh, uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, Alexander. Yes, huh? Uh, g- come here a minute, son. <laughs> Alexander, little pal. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> After all, Alexander, which is more important, a skunk or your old pop? Well, you are pop. Yeah, yeah, you see, Blondie? <laughs> <laughs> uh... Alexander, mm-hmm. come here a minute now. Uh, let me tell you a story. Sit right here on my knee, huh? Gosh, I'm pretty happy to sit on your knee, Pa. Oh, nonsense. You're still my little boy? Come on, sit right here on his knee. Well, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That, that's it. <laughs> my, it's been a long time since I've had my little baby dumpling on my lap, hasn't it? <laughs> Once upon a time, uh, maybe you better shift over to my knee, uh, Alexander. Mm-hmm. Okay. Am I too heavy, Pa? Oh, no, no. Uh, just shift over here. That's better. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. <clears throat> well, once upon a... Back on this knee, Alexander. <laughs> oh, dear. Once upon... <clears throat> well, maybe you better sit on both knees, Alexander. <laughs> If I'm too heavy, Pop, I'll be glad to... No, 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 you're not too heavy. It's just that... Uh, just sit on both knees, Alexander. <laughs> uh, that's better. Now, whew, let's see. Oh, yeah, now. <clears throat> Once upon a time, maybe you'd better stand up while I tell you the story, Alexander. <laughs> maybe you'd better forget the story altogether. Yeah, maybe so. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay, Pop. I understand. Yeah. You children run along and play. All right, Mother. Come on, baby dumpling. Cut that out, Cookie. Goodbye, folks. <laughs> Goodbye, children. Yeah, yeah but I... I but, um, yeah. You see, Blondie, he just doesn't like me much anymore. Oh, Dagwood, that's silly. He's just too big to be treated like a baby. Mm. Now, don't worry about him. He's a very happy, well-adjusted boy. Yeah, well, just the same, I'm going to start spending more time with him. Good. Mm. When I come home tonight, I'm going to read to him. That's what I'm going to do. There's no use putting it off, Blondie. There's no use procrastinating. Procrastinating. Yes. I always say procrastination is the thief of time. What do you always say? Well, I always say something that's a little bit easier to pronounce. (laughs) Oh, Mom, can I talk to you? Of course, Alexander. Here, grab a dish towel and help me while you're talking. Okay. Now, what's your problem? Mom, I'm worried about Pa. Well, he's been acting... Well... Sort of childish. Uh, Well, maybe his feelings were a little hurt when you weren't interested in having him read to you. I know. It seems to me that there ought to be a lot of things that you and your father both would be interested in. Oh, sure. Money, for instance. Yes. (laughs) 
<laughs> you and your father always have a great time keeping your allowance straight, don't you? I say we do, Mom. How does the allowance situation stand now? Pretty good. I'm two weeks ahead on it, and Pop thinks he's one week behind. <laughs> Alexander. Yeah, Pop? Hey, uh, how'd you like to play a little game with me, huh? Well, now, there's a chance to have some fun together. Sure, I'll be glad to play a game with you, Pop. Mm -hmm. What do you want to play? Chess or checkers? Oh, no. How about some tiddlywinks, huh? <laughs> okay, Pop, get the tiddlies out. <laughs> Well, Dagwood, that sounds like the children are home for dinner. Mm -hmm. They still ought to be ready in a few more minutes. Yeah, uh, Blondie, uh, I'm going to try again with Alexander. There's just no reason why we can't be better pals. That's right, Dagwood. But why don't you let him come up to your age instead of your going down to his? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, well, we'll see, dear. We'll see. Gee, Mommy, what smells so good? Yeah, what is that, Mom? Just plain old mulligan. Mulligan? Uh, sure, like old Mulligan, the janitor at the bidder's company. <laughs> Oh, Daddy's teasing you, Cookie. It's just an ordinary old stew. Yeah, it's those mulligan. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what it is, it sure smells wonderful. Yeah, almost mm -hmm. as wonderful as a slum gullion I used to cook over an open campfire. What in the world is slum gullion? Well, it's mulligan that's gone slumming. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. I, I made it on a camping trip once, and boy, was it good. <laughs> We'll have to take a trip to the mountains sometime, Jelly Jane. Golly, Pop, could we? Just you and me? What? You, you mean that you'd really like to go on a camping trip? Just you and me? I'd like that better than anything in the whole world. Good grief. Look at the mistakes Bumstead made in this. I better hung for him to come in right away. <laughs> Uh, did you honk for me, Mr. Diddy, or are you keeping a duck in your desk? <laughs> I honk for you, Gooseface. Oh. <laughs> and when I honk like this, that means get in here fast. Oh, it does, huh? Well, what does it mean if you honk it like this? <laughs> uh, stop playing with that. <laughs> You fool around with that, and I'll double you up and shove you into the file under B for booby. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just look at this order you made yeah, out. Well, 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 what's the matter with it, bossy? I don't call me bossy. I'm not a cow. Yeah. <laughs> of course not. You're all bull. <laughs> well, you cut that out. <laughs> look at this order. One thousand feet of tuba fours. Yeah. Two seven-foot bamboo fishing poles. Uh -huh. Five hundred sacks of cement and two sleeping bags. Oh, well, well, you, 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 you see, uh, J.C., I guess my mind just wasn't on my work. I, I was thinking about the trip Alexander and I are going to take to the mountains. How you manage in the mountains, I'll never know. It was? You'll probably scream for help at the first chipmunk that snarls at you. <laughs> no, no, animals don't bother me, J.C. <laughs> I'm not afraid of them. Not even skunk. Just brotherly love, huh? <laughs> you know something? Once a wild razorback hog came charging at me and I didn't move a muscle. Razorbacks are dangerous. Didn't he hurt you? No, but I had a close shave. Ah! <laughs> Like there's a jackass in here. <laughs> I, I, I can't help laughing, Mr. Dennis. And, and you know what they say, he whom laughs last. Not he whom, he who. Huh? He who, he who, he who. Hey, you're right, there is a jackass in here. <laughs> the camping books I got from the library. Well, very interesting. Let's see here. What's this? 
Through Darkest Africa with a Flashlight. Oh, I think that's a funny book about explorers. I hope so. <laughs> I hadn't bought these sleeping bags today. I bet they won't let me get on the bus with them. Holy smoke, here comes a helicopter. And it's going to land right here in the parking lot. Oh, it must be Mrs. Bob Orpington. Uh, yeah, it's got to be a gold plated. Look at it. Mrs. Bob Orpington, you. Orpington. Hey, how do you like your helicopter? Oh, simply splendid, splendid, except for a few little things. Ah. This morning, my neck nearly came unscrewed. <laughs> oh, how did that happen? Well, a newspaper caught on one of the big propeller blades, mm. and I was trying to read the headline while it was swirling around. <laughs> Trying to read the label on a phonograph record while it's spinning, huh? <laughs> Precisely. Oh, uh, but otherwise it's very handy. Oh, yes. Especially for dispersing midnight revelers. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> you know, one night some sailors were outside my door singing, Ha, you blow the man down. Well, I simply sent Orson out with the helicopter and it blew all the men down. <laughs> Yeah, well, you wait till the Navy hears about this. Mm. Oh, you know, dear boy, you make a very good sailor. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> no, I, I'm sure you'd become a petty officer. <laughs> oh, you're just saying that. You're so young, so yeah. handsome, and uh, you make me feel so nautical. <laughs> objects down there on the sidewalk. Uh, oh, those are my feet. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh I, I guess you uh, you must mean these sleeping bags, huh? Oh, so, so that's what they are. Uh, uh, little Alexander and I are going to go camping and sleep out in the open. Hmm. Do you like roughing it, Mrs. Buff Orpington? Uh, no, dear boy, I prefer smoothing it. <laughs> husband, Mr. Buff Orpington, the ah. man who invented the chicken, you know, he always used to say, yeah. he always used to say, yeah. the art of doors is wonderful. It's too bad there's so much of it outside that nobody sees it. <laughs> oh, well, I must be saying goodbye, so I'll say it. Goodbye, fly away, Orson. <laughs> My goodness, what have you there? Yeah, well, uh, camping equipment, my good woman. Hello, Daddy. Mm -hmm. Gee, what are those? Hi, yeah. Pop. Uh -huh. You'd be. Those are the snazziest sleeping bags I ever yeah, saw. Okay. Dad would. Yeah. You and Alexander aren't serious about going to the mountains, are you? Well, Blondie, we've been talking about it for two days, haven't we, son? Sure. Mm -hmm. Darling, uh -huh. I don't want to spoil your fun. But you don't seem to realize that you haven't slept outdoors for years. Mm -hmm. And Alexander never has. Jeepers, Ma. What's so hard about sleeping outdoors? The ground. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not only hard, but it's cold and wet and, and bumpy and... Well, it's something you have to be used to, dear. You have to be conditioned to it. That's right. You have to be conditioned to it. Uh, your mother's right, Alexander. You do have to get air conditioned to sleeping outdoors. <laughs> So, we'll start tonight. I'm glad you understand. What? You'll do what tonight? Sleep outdoors. Oh, oh, dear. Oh, boy, when it's bedtime, Alexander and I will take our little sleeping bags and head far out into the backyard. <laughs> Oh, it's just fine, Blondie. Uh, you go to bed now, dear. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night, Mom. Well, mm. oh, come on, son. Hop into that old sleeping bag. Look it, Pop. Just <laughs> a second. Yeah. Hey, worry, War. Are you under there? Yeah, I, I would... <laughs> Alexander, what are you looking for? Oh, I just want to make sure Worry Wart isn't underneath my sleeping bag. Yeah, who's Worry Wart? My frog. Oh, uh... <laughs> 
I call him Worrywart because after I touch him, I always worry about getting warts. Oh. <laughs> he, he sleeps out here someplace. Yeah, well, let him find his own sleeping bag. Come on, let's, let's get going here. Now, let me zip up your old bag here. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, this is swell. I'm as snug as a bug in a rug. Yeah. Night, Pop. Yes. I'll see the boys at the o'clock at about the time, yeah. <laughs> uh, what'd you say, Alexander? <laughs> I didn't say anything, Pop. I didn't, well. I guess I can. Night, Pop. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter, Pop? Alexander, we aren't alone. Someone just laid a cold, clammy hand on my forehead. <laughs> Alexander, have you got a cold, clammy hand that croaks like a frog? Oh, that's worry work, Pop. I can see him. He's sitting right on your forehead. Get him off! <laughs> well, get him off. He might think my nose is a cricket. Get him off! <laughs> I got him, Pop. Well, okay, now. Whew. Look, Alexander, let's please, let's try and get just a little sleep now. Would you mind? Mm-hmm. Well, <sighs> I know I said. My Pop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, Pop. Huh? I'm awful thirsty. <laughs> Tell Worry Wart to bring you a drink. <laughs> I'm kind of hungry myself. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Mom said she put some sandwiches and milk in the basement. Yes, she did? Uh, well, come on. What are we waiting for? These sandwiches are swell. Yeah. You know, it's kind of nice and cozy down here in the basement. Yeah, it is. Gee, look, Pop. What? I forgot we had those folding cots down here. Mm-hmm. They look pretty comfortable, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Are you weakening a little bit, Alexander? No, Pop. Oh, neither am I. <laughs> I knew you'd like sleeping outside in your old sleeping bag. Oh, sure. I like sleeping outside my old sleeping bag. Yeah. You know, some people probably think it's better sleeping inside. Yeah, I know one. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you'd really uh, rather sleep outside, huh? Under the stars? Well, I'm not so sure it's safe, Pop. One of those stars might fall on us. Yeah. Oh, you think so? Huh? Yeah, they might, yeah. It's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, that's a good excuse. Uh, I mean, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> there is an awful lot of stars up there, and some of them might get loose at that. Yeah. Well, well. What? Look, Pop, there's that cedar chest where Mom keeps her extra blankets. Well, well. <laughs> Alexander, let's stop kidding each other, huh? Okay. I'll bring in the sleeping bags and you make up the cot. Oh, it's a good idea. Tonight we'll get accustomed to sleeping outside, inside. Mm. <laughs> hey, you know, maybe tomorrow night we'll sleep outside. What do oh, you think? Oh, sure we will. Sure. We'll put the old sleeping bags in the corner of the basement and won't say anything about it. But tomorrow night we can make up our minds. Yeah. Sleeping outside sure is wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you have a roof over your head. <laughs> Another waffle, Dagwood? Yeah, no thanks, Bondy, dear. I always heard it was unlucky to have 13. <laughs> well, but guess what? Gee, Daddy, um, I didn't know you were ever through eating. How about you, Alexander? Gosh, no, Mom. I'm up to my back teeth now. Well, after a night spent in the open air, I was expecting both of you to be as hungry as wolves. How did you like your sleeping bag? Uh, oh, uh, well, uh, uh, that's right, Mom. Yeah, uh, Blondie, uh, please don't say anything to the neighbors about our sleeping in the backyard last night, will you, dear? Uh, you see, they wouldn't understand. Gentlemen, your secret is safe with me. It's safe with me, too, gentlemen. Yeah, oh, thanks. Uh, oh, I wonder who that is at the back door. Uh, come in. Good morning, nature boy. Uh, yeah, I was going to visit you in the backyard last night, but then I remember the old saying, let sleeping bags lie. <laughs> hey, uh, Woodley, who told you that we were sleeping out? Why, it's all over Shady Lane Avenue. In fact, somebody is offering ten to one odds that you won't last a week. Why, Herb, who's doing that? Me. <laughs> well, so long, folks. Yeah, so long. 
There goes my old pal and buddy, Woodley. Uh, nice guy he is. Well, somebody at the front door now. I'll get it. I guess everybody's coming to congratulate you on spending the night outdoors. Hey, Alexander. Hey, they were heroes, huh? Uh, take it easy, Pop. Right. Don't overdo it. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, son, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Dithers, Dad, Mr. Dithers, oh, goody. What do you suppose... What do you suppose Mr. Dithers wants, Dad? Mm, I don't know. Nothing more than my life's blood, I suppose. <laughs> Oh, good morning, Monson. I understand you slept outside last night. Oh, I did? I mean, yes, I did. <laughs> All night. Well, I can understand you sleeping, but when morning came, weren't you bothered by woodpeckers? You weren't bothered by anything in our... <laughs> woodpeckers? <laughs> we weren't bothered by anything in our sleeping bags, huh, Pop? Sleeping bags? Hey, sure. Alexander and I got those little old sleeping bags, so we tried them out last night. You should have gotten a desk. You sleep better there than anywhere. <laughs> oh, no. This sleeping bag is a cat. It's made so that it covers everything but my face. You might know they'd make it wrong. <laughs> well, I just hope this sleeping outside doesn't affect your work at the office. Then why, Mr. Giddy? Because if it does, I'll make you swallow a banana whole. And then reach down your throat and peel it. Oh, my. <laughs> Alexander. Yoo-hoo. Hey, it's time to get up. Oh, already? Yeah. Gee, Pop, how much longer do we have to do this? You mean sneak down to the basement after everybody has gone to bed? Yeah. These cots are awful uncomfortable. Yeah, but think how much worse those darn sleeping bags were. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess Mom would sure laugh at us if she knew we didn't want to go to the mountains anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess she would. Oh, well. I can stand it if you can, Dad. Yeah, attaboy, attaboy. You're a real pal, Alexander. So are you, Pop. Ha, huh? I am? <laughs> Do you know something, Alexander? I've always wanted to be a pal. Good morning, dear. Uh, Blondie, uh -huh. uh, what are you doing up so early? Good morning, Mom. Dagwood, ah. I want to have a little talk with you and Alexander. Oh, sure, dear. Is something wrong? No, dear. It's just that... Well, Dagwood, I want you to do something for me. Hey, you sound kind of serious. I am. I don't want you and Alexander to go to the mountains. Please, dear, for me. Uh, well, uh, Blondie, we've spent a lot of time getting air conditioned. Oh, all right. You can go. Oh, no, 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 dear. For your sake, we won't go. Uh, Okay, son? Well, I'll say. I, I mean, sure, Pop. Of course, we had planned a little trip together, but if you I intend... still want you to have a trip together. Uh, you do? Yes. Mm. I was thinking how nice it would be for you to drive to Fremont for the weekend. Mm. I understand the bass fishing is just wonderful. Gee, Pop, that sounds like fun. Yeah, it sure does. But, uh, oh, no, it's out of the question. Where would we stay? We can't afford it. I thought of that, too. Mm. So... I scraped together fifty dollars for you, darling. Gee, Pop, everything sure worked out swell. I, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ne never mind, Alexander. Never mind. Uh, hey, uh, Blondie dear, uh, just where did you get this fifty dollars? Well, I. Oh, what difference does it make? Just take the money and have a nice weekend, dear. Oh, it sounds wonderful, Blondie. Oh, and boy, we're all toughing up from sleeping outside these last few days. There's nothing like sleeping on the hard ground to put you in fighting trim. Don't overdo it, Pop. I know you've suffered getting into condition. Yeah, but we didn't mind, dear. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, but uh, really, well, where did you get the $50? Oh, that. Mm. Well, dear, I returned your sleeping bags to the store almost a week ago. <laughs> The show was heard in the United States over NBC, the National Broadcasting Company, and has been rebroadcast to our servicemen and women overseas by the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs>
hot dog. What kinds of kids eat armor hot dog? Fat kids, 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 Even kids with chicken pox love hot dogs. Armor hot dogs. The dog kids love to bite. Picking it up on the old banjo, put on the mustard and away we go. Johnny Moore speaking. Hello, Junior. This is Jimmy. Jimmy Durante, where are you? At my girl's house, and it's awful. When I left for New York two weeks ago, she weighed 150 pounds. Now she weighs 200. You mean she's gained 50 pounds in the interim? Yes, and on the outer rim, too. <laughs> C-A-M-E-L-S. Camel Cigarettes present Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore. <laughs> Yes, it's the Friday Night Camel Show. Gary Moore, Jimmy Durante, Roy Boggy and his orchestra, and yours truly, Howard Petrie. Brought to you by Camel, the cigarette that's first in the service according to actual sales records. See if your throat and your taste don't make Camel a first with you, too. Find out for yourself. And now, friends, it's my privilege to introduce the sweetest, kindest, most generous man I know. I've said that for many Christmases past, and I say it now for the present. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Skip, it. here he is, Gary Moore. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, my friends. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I be the first to wish you a very happy Eve before the Eve before the Eve before Christmas. <laughs> and by the way, Howard, I want to thank you for that nice heating pad you gave me. Oh, Gary, that wasn't a heating pad. That was an electric toaster. Electric to... <laughs> no wonder I kept popping out of bed all night. <laughs> Tomorrow night, I'd better butter myself. And believe me, Howard, you know, Christmas shopping is a problem this year. For instance, I couldn't think of a thing to give to Betty Grable. After all, she's got so much already, and like I say, I... I, <laughs> I, I couldn't think of anything she needed, so I walked around, I walked around and looked in all the windows. Well, what was the result? Harry James came out and said, quit looking in our windows. <laughs> I was so embarrassed, I almost dropped my periscope. But let me tell you, Howard, that I... I oh, there you are, Mr. Moore, you lovely man. <laughs> It looks like I'm getting my turkey early this year. <laughs> uh, how, how are you, Mrs. Wordlebertle? Oh, please, Mr. Moore, don't be mean to me tonight. I want to make a good impression. You see, my mother-in-law is out in front. She's out in front, eh? Well, those wartime girdles don't last forever. <laughs> what? What, uh, what is it that brings you here tonight, Monday? Mr. Moore, hmm? I have come to receive your congratulations. No. I just took my automobile driving test, and I am now a qualified California driver. Well, which are you, qualified or a California driver? <laughs> Can't be both, you know. Say, listen, I was sensational in my test. Well, didn't it make you nervous to have a policeman sitting right on the front seat with you? Not in the least. I just kept my hand on the wheel, my foot on the brake, my eye on the road, and my nose out the window. Your nose out the window? Yes, the policeman's horse sat between us. <laughs> oh, but now I'm worried, Mr. Moore. I have my license, but I still don't really understand about cars. What actually makes an automobile go? Well, there are several things that make an automobile go, one of which was gasoline. But, <laughs> but to really understand cars, Mrs. W., go out and lift up the hood of your own car. Of course, first wiping off yesterday's pedestrians. And there, my dear, <laughs> there, my dear, before your very eyes lies the engine. Just think how thousands of workmen have fashioned hundreds of pieces of metal to just one millionth of an inch, so that when you start the engine, it'll knock till your teeth rattle. <laughs> It's wonderful, isn't it? Mr. Moore, that still doesn't answer my question. How does a car go? Oh, you don't want me to tell you that. Everybody knows that. Well, I don't, so tell me. How does a car go? (laughs) Having eased myself of that opinion, let's introduce that genius of his generation, the one and only Jimmy Durante in person. Better, you even look better. Um, dream. 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 D
dreaming of a white Christmas heart. Bing <laughs> Crosby, if you're listening in, you better start saving your money. <laughs> Jimmy. Hello, Junior. Merry Christmas, Jimmy. Merry Christmas, Junior. Some, Some lousy necktie, necktie you gave me. <laughs> well, Jimmy, what have you been doing all week? Christmas shopping? Christmas shopping? Anybody who hasn't done their Christmas shopping before now has nothing above their ears. Well? Just call me Flat Top. <laughs> I, I shall, Jimmy. You know, I, I have a little present for you. It's, it's an electric train. Here, I'll show you how it runs. Isn't that swell? What happened? What happened? I thought I saw an empty seat. (laughs) But, Junior, thanks for the present, and I didn't forget you. I bought you a nice bottle of oldie cologne. In fact, I'm wearing some of it now. Mm. Yes, it's fetching. What's the name of it? Ten Nights in a Drainage Canal. (laughs) Ten Nights in a Drainage Canal? What did you have to spend to get it? Ten Nights in a Drainage Canal. Lovely, Jimmy. I think maybe a better name for it would be Fleur de Sewer. <laughs> <laughs> Let that laugh be your Christmas present, Mr. Moore. <laughs> You're getting awfully small presents this year, but tell me, Jimmy, did you get a present for your girlfriend, Elsie Pepperpool? Yes, I got Elsie an electric razor and some shaving lotion. <laughs> a razor and shaving lotion for Elsie? Yes, Junior. I gave her something I can use because every year she gives the presents back to me. You know, I looked awful silly last year wearing those pink lace panties. <laughs> I love that kind of carry on. <laughs> but that is neither Lionel, Barry, nor more. <laughs> last night I received an invitation to a special showing of my new MGM picture, Music for Millions. Oh, yes. And Junior, what a picture, what a cast. The stars of the picture were Margaret O'Brien, Herman Schwartz, Jose Iturbi, Herman Schwartz, June Allison, Herman Schwartz, Jimmy Durante, and Herman Schwartz. Wait a minute, Jimmy. Where does Herman Schwartz fit in the picture? The film was developed in his drugstore. <laughs> <laughs> well, enough, uh, enough of your thespian activities. Tell me, Jimmy, are you going to play Santa Claus for the children again this year? No, Gary, I've had my lesson. Last year I was humiliated, begun, chagrin. You were begone, Sharon. Well, why, what, what happened? Well, that's Latin if you don't like that. Oh, <laughs> what happened? What happened? Yeah. Well, while I was wearing my Santa Claus suit, yeah. a little boy walked over, took one look at my schnoz, and said, I've seen Santa Clauses before, but this is the first time I ever saw one wearing his pack in front. <laughs> Well, Christmas doesn't worry me, Jimmy. I've got all my shopping done. Me too, Junior, but what an experience I had in a Hollywood department store. Yeah? At one counter, I buys a turtleneck sweater for my Uncle Joe, who has a turtleneck. <laughs> At another counter, I buys a real-life puppy that goes woof, woof, woof. And finally, I buys a ten-foot Christmas tree that fits exactly on my piazza. Just as I'm leaving the store, I hear the floor walker scream, Help! Help! Get me some water! So putting down the turtleneck sweater, the ten-foot Christmas tree, and the real-life puppy that goes woof, 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 I rushes around, finds some water, and gives it to the floor walker, just in time, too. One more second and his carnation would have died. (laughs) My one good deed for the day being done, I picks up the turtleneck sweater, the ten-foot Christmas tree, and the real-life puppy that goes woof, 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 and heads from a car that's parked across the street. But can I cross? No. The light is red and I gotta wait. So I puts down the turtleneck sweater, the ten-foot Christmas tree, and the real live puppy that goes woof, 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 and waits and waits and waits. At last, the light turns green, ready to cross. I looks at the puppy. I looks at the tree. Now I gotta wait for the puppy. <laughs> Canine catastrophe. I'm standing there whistling uh, jingle bells between clenched teeth. When the light changes again, but is it green? No. Is it red? No. It's yellow. I'm fuming and they're bringing in new colors. (laughs) Not being able to outwit those double-crossing lights, what do I do? I decide to employ strategy. The street is a muck with miracles, and automobiles too. (laughs) So I figures out that if I go through the back door of every car, I'll be on the other side of the street before you can say, Shadrach, Meshach, and (laughs) Umbriago. Quick as a 
flash, I opens the door of the first car. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Pardon me, sailor. <laughs> Tragedy works, and now I'm across the street on the sidewalk of victory. So putting down my turtleneck sweater, my ten foot three, and my puppy that goes woof woof woof, I'm ready to continue to my car. When I looks around on Junior, I start fermenting all over again. Well, what was wrong? You were on the sidewalk, weren't you? Yes, but I was on a sidewalk in Glendale. No. Now you know that you can't go wrong. I can out all day to the And now, while the irrepressible Mr. Durante retires to his corner long enough for his seconds to revive him, our distinguished colleague, Mr. Petrie, steps to the center of the ring. Well, thank you, Gary, for that distinguished, because that is the adjective that really applies to the subject of my brief discourse, camel cigarettes. For camels bring to every smoker's taste and throat a distinguished blend of costlier tobaccos. And it's the rich, full flavor of these tobaccos and their cool mildness that distinguishes camels from so many other cigarettes. So, folks, try camels on your own tea zone. That's tea for taste and tea for throat. The world's best proving ground for a cigarette. C-A-M-E-L-S. Camels, a distinguished blend of costlier tobaccos. As his Yuletide special, Roy Bargy presents his arrangement of Raymond Scott's Toy Trumpet. Bargain is 19 men playing the toy trumpet. 19 men blowing into one trumpet. They must know each other very well. <laughs> but enough of this, Renny Kazazel and Fiddly D. Uh-huh. Junior, what have you in store for the culture corner tonight? Well, earlier tonight, James, you gave us your version of I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, and I hardly think I should let the season go by without taking a crack at it myself. So, uh, <clears throat> stand back while I throw out my diaphragm. Very well. I shall run and get my catch's mitt in case you throw it my way. <laughs> Thank you, James. Maestro? I'm dreaming of a white Christmas With every Christmas card I write I love you passionately, Stephanie Hootnockle <laughs> Oh, I loved you, darling, and I shall never forget the night we met, my love 
was Christmas Eve and I was tramping through the crisp white snow when my foot slipped in a puddle of slush. I leaned over to clean off my shoe. And there you were, my sweet. Oh, yes, there you were, Angel. Your lovely face nestled between my galoshes. I looked down at you ever so gently and said, Hello there. Ah, but you were the shy type. All you could do was smile and blow snowballs. But ever so gently, ever so gently, I took your hands and pulled you up and... Oh, what lovely hands you had, darling. What lovely hands. They looked positively Grecian. Like you'd been Grecian automobiles. <laughs> oh, darling. And holding you from me, holding you from me at arm's length, I looked you over, lover. And I could tell you were the salt of the earth. Too bad I couldn't say much for your shaker. <laughs> and ever so slowly... Ever so slowly, darling, you smiled at me. Yes, you smiled, and I saw your teeth. Your teeth were like pearls. And that was the trouble. You smiled too wide, and the string broke. <laughs> oh. oh, how we laughed, my darling. How we laughed as we fished through the snow, straining your teeth through my handkerchief. <laughs> Finally, we found them. Yes, we found them, and you bit out I love you on the handle of my snow shovel. <laughs> how we... We could have been so happy, my darling. You were my little snowflake, and I was your vitamin flint heart. Um, now recall how upset our friends were when several months later they read in Winchell's column that we had f***ed. But we knew that we hadn't f***ed at all. That f noise was just me letting the air out of your head. Yes, we could have been happy, but then it happened. We had walked far out in the country and were crossing a frozen lake. Suddenly, the ice began to stir beneath our feet as if the angry waters resented our trespassing. With a groan like that of a wounded jungle beast, the ice began to tear itself asunder. Look out, Stephanie! I see the ice breaking up! The ice is breaking down! Look out! Ah! I... friends, with Georgia Gibbs still on the sick list in New York, but very much in our hearts out here, we've asked Roy Boggy to send the Christmas greeting of all of us to Georgia with a song that means a lot to her. There goes that song again. Georgia Marie. Great, Mr. Boggy. You know, Junior, I teach music, too. Yeah? Every night I teach Lana Turner, Paulette Goddard, Bette Davis. Jimmy, uh... Jimmy, they can't sing. Aren't you wasting your time? My boy is very young. <laughs> but there's something I've been teaching all smokers. Listen. C A M E L S from Boston to Sardinia. Camels are smoked that show to win you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm no music critic, Jimmy, but the words are great. Camels have a way of winning people who try them. That rich, full flavor of Camels' magnificent blend of costlier tobaccos seems to click with people's taste the world around. And Camels' kind, cool mildness seems to be mighty welcome to millions of throats. Look, all you folks, why don't you try Camels on your own tea zone? Tea for taste and tea for throat. It's the best place to find out which cigarette is best for you. And like those millions of people we were talking about, the answer may be... C-A-M-E-L-S Camels, the cigarette of costlier tobaccos. And now...
Now the Friday Night Camel Show brings you a drama of animals in the zoo and the men who take care of them. End titles. The keeper walked into the hungry lion's cage today and accidentally turned his back. Or... Sorry, the lion is busy. <laughs> Remarks like that will make us candidates for oblivion. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy, tonight you and I are caretakers in a zoo. Have you had any experience with wild animals? What a question. Why, you're speaking to the foremost trainer of hippopotamuses. <laughs> the word is hippopotamus. How can you train a hippopotamus if you can't even say his name? What's the difference? He can't say my name either. <laughs> Comes out of you. Well, come on, Jimmy. We're due at the zoo. Let's shuffle over there. You shuffle. I just dealt. <laughs> uh, hello, Moore Durante Zoo. Moore speaking. Mr. Moore, this is the children's day nursery. Did you call us this morning? Why, yes, I did. We want you to take care of a baby kangaroo for us. Well, why can't the mother carry the baby in her pouch? Well, she drank some Coca-Cola this morning and can't keep a thing on her stomach. <laughs> Trouble, 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 trouble. Hold everything, Junior. Hold everything. Treachery stalks my path. What's the matter, Jimmy? I just had a horrible experience. I walks into the moose cage, and the mama moose comes charging down on me. So I grabbed her by the horns. But a mama moose doesn't have any horns. I know. Would you care to join me in a cup of moose milk? <laughs> no, I'm... Um... Jimmy, I've, I've had enough trouble of my own. Our new giraffe developed a sore throat, and I had to call up Dr. Rappaport to come over and swab it. Yes, I noticed a big swelling in the giraffe's throat. What is that, a swollen gland? That's Dr. Rappaport, still swabbing. <laughs> but that's not our only problem, Jimmy. Our pet ostrich is in a deplorable condition. Her neck is scrawny, her eyes are popping out, her feathers are molting. Maybe we'd better go over and see the ostrich. Oh, there you are, gentlemen. Too late. The ostrich came to see us. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I'm Miss Flora Bell Farfel. Mm -hmm. I came in here to buy an unusual Christmas present for my family. You see, my family collects odd things. You must have been a great addition to their collection. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, I want to buy my family an octopus for Christmas. Octopus? octopus? Yes. And I want the kind of octopus that has only six legs. It's very rare. A six-legged octopus? Well, that's the rarest species there is. It's known as the Octopoda punctatus bocalopus. Octopoda punctatus bocalopus? <laughs> Everybody wants to get into the act. <laughs> Gentlemen, I want you to get this octopus for me, even if you have to sail the seven seas. Very well, madam. Come on, Jimmy. We're off to the seven seas. <laughs> Giblet, weigh the captain and batten down the poop deck. <laughs> Seaman Durante, Seaman Durante, the ship isn't acting right. Are you sure you checked the fuel? Aye, aye, sir. I just went down to the boiler room and filled the tanks with beer. You filled the ship's tanks with beer? Sure. Ain't this a schooner? <laughs> <laughs> I got a million of them. <laughs> Oh, mate, mate, I don't think you should have shipped out with me. After all, I come from a long line of sea captains. You do? Why, my uncle was on board ship when Admiral Dewey said, you may fire Gridley when you are ready. Well, my uncle was ready. So? So, he fired Gridley. <laughs> Served him right. Yeah. Well, Skipper, it's getting pretty dark. We need some light to see our way. Yes, I'd better send up an orange flare. Uh, Seaman Petrie! Aye, aye, sir. I want you to send up an orange flare. Send up an orange flare? I won't do it, I tell you. Throw me in the brig, put me on bread and water, but I won't! I won't send up an orange flare! Why not? An orange flare in a green ocean? Why, they'd clash! <laughs> <laughs> you know, Gary, I'll get rid of that guy as soon as he finishes crocheting my hammock. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we must be near the place where the six-legged octopus is. We better take a sounding. Where's the lead? It's in my hip pocket. Well, get the lead out of your pocket and take a sounding. <laughs> a vast, maybe there's a storm of brewing. Now we'll never find the six-legged octopus. Man overboard! Man overboard! What am I yelling for? It's me. <laughs> Don't worry, Jimmy. I'll throw you a lifesaver. <laughs> Well, never mind. Now that I'm in here, I'll hand it to you. <laughs> Gee whiz, Jimmy, isn't it, isn't it dark? I, I can't see a thing. Don't worry, Junior. We'll save each other. Oh, Jimmy, I, I want to thank you for holding me up in the water this way. But, Junior, I ain't holding you up in the water. Well, of course you are. You got your legs wrapped around me. Here's one leg. Here's two legs. 
Here's three legs. <laughs> Here's four legs. Five legs. Jimmy, I think we've caught the six-legged octopus. I beg to differ. The six-legged octopus has caught us. <laughs> Welcome back, gentlemen. Oh, well, welcome back yourself. <laughs> oh, isn't it wonderful? But who is that you have with you? Oh, it's the octopus. Well, you're close. It's Mr. Durante. <laughs> I should never have come out of the water. <laughs> Miss Popple, Miss Popple, we have your six-legged octopus outside. But before we bring it in, there's one thing we want to know. Yes? You said you wanted it as a Christmas present for your family. Yes. But why must it be an octopus with only six legs? Why? I have three sisters and they never have anyone to take them dancing. No. Thanks to the Yanks of the Week. Tonight a salute and a Merry Christmas to Sergeant Robert E. Paris of Longmont, Colorado. This medical aid man with the 45th Thunderbird Division has won the Silver Star for his gallantry under heavy shelling in the Italian theater. In your honor, Sergeant Paris, the makers of camels are sending to our fighters overseas 400,000 camel cigarettes. Each of the three camel shows honors the Yank of the Week by sending free 400,000 camel cigarettes overseas, a total of more than a million camels sent free each week. In this country, the camel caravans traveling from camp to camp have thanked audiences of more than four million yanks with free shows and free camels. Now who will be with you when I'm far away? Yeah, when, where? Let me hear that high note, maestro. What a note. A cheerful note, Mr. Durant. A yuletide note, Mr. Moore. And Jimmy, if I had the proper refreshments in store, I'd invite the entire cast up to my house for Christmas dinner. Well, don't let that stop you, Gary. I'll bring a bottle of champagne. Well, I'll bring a bottle of sparkling burgundy. As for me, I'll bring a bottle of sauterne. Well, Jimmy, what'll you bring? I'll bring a bottle opener. (laughs) (laughs) And friends, before we leave you, Jimmy and I and the whole gang want to send to each one of you our warmest wishes at this Christmas time. May we join you in the hope that next Christmas we'll find our family circles together once more. That our hearts be full of hope and our stockings full of war bonds. That's my boy who said that. Merry Christmas, Mr. Durante. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Camel broadcasts go out to the United States three times a week, are rebroadcast to our men overseas and to South America. Listen Monday to Bob Hawk in Thanks to the Yanks. Thursday to Abbott and Costello. And next Friday, listen to Georgia Gibbs, Roy Barge and his orchestra, yours truly, Howard Petrie. And Jimmy Durrani. And Gary Moore. In In person. And remember, try camels on your throat and your taste. See for yourself how camels' mildness, coolness, and flavor click with you. No matter how careful you are, those last-minute names always seem to crop up on the gift list. Well, wipe that worried frown off your brow. Here's a swell idea for the men on your list. A big pound or half-pound package of Prince Albert smoking tobacco with the bright Christmas band. Long after Christmas has come and gone, they'll enjoy your gift. Because men like Prince Albert's rich, full-bodied, yet mild flavor. And it's aged in the wood aroma. And the way it packs, draws, and burns. And it's wonderful tongue gentleness thanks to the no-bite treatment. It's a swell Christmas present. Tomorrow, Saturday night, be sure to listen to Prince Albert's Grand Old Opry for nearly 19 years bringing the real authoritative American folk music and fun to southern radio audiences and now broadcast coast to coast. Remember, Grand Old Opry every Saturday night on another network. And remember, Camel Cigarettes again present Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore next Friday night at this same time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. KNX, Columbia Square, Los Angeles.